In this tutorial, I'm going to talk about how to model curves in Maya using particles. Now, why would you want to do this? Well, I'm sure there are plenty of reasons. The reason that I did this originally was uh, because I was creating an animation about chromosomes and I had to show them in their uncondensed form. So here's the little still from that animation and chromosomes, DNA, uh, when it's uncondensed, it's just this loose strand of bundles, actually lots of little um, sub bundles in this big bundle that exists in the nucleus. But you can see here that ultimately what we have are uh, a bunch of strand-like structures that are all woven together. Now to do this by hand would be a pain, so um, I use a technique where I send particles out of an emitter and have them trace a curve behind them, and by subjecting them to forces, uh, turbulence fields and so on, we can get this sort of complex structure curve, and then I can use that to generate some geometry like I did here, or you can use it with paint effects. Um, after this tutorial, I'll talk about uh, maybe the next steps in generating this, these chromosomes for this animation. But for now, let's just stick to the basic topic. We want to create something like this, and I'll do it from scratch, but I just want to show you. So we've got particles being emitted out of here, and you can see that they're flying all around. They're being submitted to a turbulence field, and they're leaving curves behind them. Now, if I stop the animation, you can see I've got a whole bunch of curves. Now, you can imagine that if I put these inside a collision object, which is what I did here to keep them inside a volume, um, you can change the quality of the curves and so on. So it's an easy way to generate something that looks random and sort of natural. It's what dynamics are good for, uh, taking some control out of your hands, but allowing you to create something that is um, more natural looking, more random, that's difficult to impart in a model when you model by hand. So let's just delete all this stuff and we'll just do it from scratch. Now we're going to create uh, uh, an emitter. I'm using n particles. This works with regular or the old-fashioned particles in Maya too. So let's create an omni emitter. I'll give it some speed, and so it's five. Make it ten particles per second. Whatever, it doesn't really matter. Just want to get them moving. Oh, it's all this stuff that got created. Let me just make sure everything is deleted, and do that again. And particles, particles create and particles create emitter. Omni ten five good. Now I'll just play the animation, and I also gave myself some extra frames, so I'm up to a thousand frames here, just so we can watch it play out. So these things are just flying around. They're just flying straight out because I don't have any turbulence yet. So let's add some turbulence. So we'll just select this uh, particle shape. Go to fields. Turbulence, I want to make sure volume shape is turned off, attenuation is off, and it's got a reasonable magnitude. All right, so now if I play the animation, you can see they're all swimming around. So that's great. Now one thing I am going to do, just to limit the number of curves that are created, is go into my particle shape and under emission attributes, you can see that max count by default is set to minus one. That means infinity. Let's keep creating particles until your computer falls to its knees or you run out of frames. So I'm just going to limit it to, let's say, 25 particles, and then it will stop. <clears throat> and maybe I'll change the color of the particles just so it's easier to see on screen. So under shading here, these are clouds. I'll just change them to red particles. Let's see, there we go. Now there's 25 created, and then they just stop being created, but the others keep moving because turbulence is acting on them. Okay, so this involves expression writing. So I've got the particle shape selected, and I have to go down to the per particle array attributes. Now, I'm going to assume you know a little bit about doing this sort of thing. Uh, one thing that always messes up my students is that, let's say I want to write, um, an expression about position. You can't just click in here and write. You have to right click on it and open the expression editor. 
creation expression or a runtime expression. But it really doesn't matter which one you click in because it all goes into the same sort of repos repository. <clears throat> so even though I'm going to write uh, an expression about position, I can right click on velocity and say creation expression here. Because it doesn't put anything in here. It gives me, if it was about velocity, I could just copy and paste this name, which is, I guess, the benefit of doing that. But you can select any of these things and do it here. But anyway, I just end up typing it. So the first thing I want to do is declare a new variable. And this is a vector variable called dollar sign POS, which is pretty typical when you want to create a variable, variable to uh, hold the position values of the particles ending with semicolon and I'm going to create this. Now I've got this already typed up to make sure I don't make a mistake. So the next thing I want to do is create a new um, variable. Let me just zoom in here so we can see. It's a string variable so it just means it's a collection of characters. Um, and it's going to be called curve name equals and then the first part of the name will be curve underscore and then to that we're going to add the particle ID so each particle when it's born the first one its particle ID is 0 and then it'll go on up to 24 for us so the first curve that's created will be called curve underscore 0 okay Now we're going to skip over this part here for now and we'll come back to that. I'm going to copy the next statement here and paste it in. Let's just zoom in. So this is the command for creating a curve. So what happens when a particle is born? Um, a variable called dollar sign POS is created and it holds the position of each particle. And then a new variable is created, it's a string variable, and it just records the particle ID and adds that to the end of curve underscore. And now this next line that we've just added is a command, so it creates a curve and it puts the position of the first control vertex of the curve according to these values. So this flag um, dash P is position and the position for the first point is going to be drawn from the position of the particle which is in the dollar sign POS variable so this is a vector variable so it's got three values so dollar sign POS dot X dollar sign POS dot Y and dot Z so it's created a new curve. It's only got one point so far, so it actually doesn't generate a curve. It just generates that first point. And then we name it according to the particle ID. So it's drawing that information from this variable. Okay. Great. Now that creates the curve and assesses where the first point is. And it's going to be at the origin where the, where the emitter is. Now we also have to write a runtime expression. And we have to de declare that variable again, the vector position variable. So I'm just going to copy that here. And we're doing the naming again. Now think about it. I don't know if that's actually absolutely necessary, but we'll see. Now, here is the important line in the next part. So, in the creation expression, we created the curve, right? And we established the position of its first point and gave it a name. Now we've got an if statement. We'll come back to that in a second. Here we've got the curve command again, but before we have the dash P flag, we have the dash append flag. So now we're taking that first curve, or the curve that was created, and appending a new point at a certain position. And again, it's taking it from that value, dollar sign position, in the x, y, and z values. 
and then giving it a curve name. Okay, so creation expression, we start the curve. In the runtime expression, we add to the curve more points. Now, if we just left this as is, it would create a new point on every frame. And that could be pretty dense. So if I let this run for a thousand frames, it would be a curve with a thousand points. Now that's what this if statement is doing here. This is setting a condition before this part is executed. We're saying if the frame number divided by five is equivalent to the frame number divided by five, but truncated, which is to say frame divided by five with no remainder. So this means it will on every fifth frame. Now there are other ways to do this. Um, I think there is a function called fmod or something like that where you can also set these intervals. But this way works just fine. And if we wanted to have a curve on every tenth frame, we could just change these, oops, these values to 10 here. And that will work to every 20th frame, just change them both to 20. Okay, so let's just copy this stuff. And just uh, to review, if you haven't seen this before, this is the structure of an if statement. So if this condition is met and it's in brackets and the two dollar, uh, not dollar signs, the two equal signs means equivalent. So if this is equivalent to this, so if they have the same value, and then you have a curly bracket, and then within that you have a command. So this command is, oops, only executed if this statement um, is met. Okay, so let's say create. And I'm always looking down here to see if I get a warning when I press create or edit in the expression to see if I have a syntax error or an, or an undeclared variable or something like that. So let's play the animation. And you can see it's working. The particles are moving along and they're generating curves. If I stop the animation, select a curve and go into the CV points, so you can see that they're spaced out a reasonable distance that's because it's only evaluated on every fifth frame now if I rewind the animation you can see the curves are still there um, for ease of use if this is something you have to you want to run a few times normally you can just go in and delete all the curves and then run the um, the animation again and you'll get new curves but we can add something to the particle expression that will um, just automate that process of deleting the already created curves for us. So in the creation expression, oops, where'd that go? Um, in the creation expression, we can do a little test to see if those curves exists, exist. So here we go. We're creating a new variable. It's an integer variable, so it's a whole number, um, and it's called dollar sign obj or object test equals object exists, and this is a mel command. And here's the variable we set before. So, and then you can see it's surrounded by these little tick marks that are on your tilde key, and whenever you put anything inside of tick marks, a command, it it captures the results of that command. So in this case, we're telling Maya to test whether an object exists. So we say, Maya, does this object exist? Curve name. And you can see curve name was created here, and that's generated based on uh, this first uh, prefix and then the particle ID. So if we run the animation once, we get 24 or 25 curves and we'll, they'll be numbered from zero to 24. And then if we run it again, before it creates a new curve down here, Maya is gonna test if a, a curve with that name already exists. And if it does, so if this variable object, object test is equivalent to one, that means yes, then delete that curve. 
and then it will just recreate a new one in the next step. So I'm going to copy this, go back in here, paste that in, hit edit, see if I get a warning. Nope, we're good. And so let's see if this works. And I'll keep my outliner open so we can see the curves as they're created. So I'll just rewind and play the animation. See the curves being created there in the outliner. Let them go for a little bit. And you can see they're moving around randomly in 3D space according to the parameters you've set in that turbulence field. Yep, so 24 or 25 curves were created starting at number 0, ending at number 24. Now if I rewind the animation, the curves are still there. But if I start to play it, let's see if we can see this here. You can see it's deleting curves and then recreating them. So that little object exists test um, does that for us. Play it again. They delete first and then we play it out again. Now finally if I wanted to create something simple like a sphere. Let's go into four mode here so we can see the wireframe. I'm just going to delete the history of this sphere and I'm going to end mesh, turn it into a passive collider. So it's under the same nucleus node so those particles should collide with it. Now if I rewind and play the animation those curves will all disappear and now you can see those particles are locked inside this space and we can get a uh, more confined and condensed group of curves. So just stop that and I'm just going to delete this sphere here and you can see that we get something different, something interesting depending on what you want to do. Now these curves could be used for anything, for paint effects, for modeling, for rigging, you know, sky's the limit. So I hope that's helpful. Um, I'd be interested to see what people use it for, if it's useful at all for you. I'm going to come back and talk about maybe the next steps uh, that I used for creating these chromosomes in Maya. These you versions can... are called... Oops. Um, some of them are a different length, and that's the next step I'll talk about in terms of controlling the creation of these curves using particles and some simple expressions. So I'll see you in the next video. Hope this is useful. Thanks.